Well, hello there. Here we are to uh, tape our service, Sunday service again uh, for this week as we come to the end of January and we soon will be into February of 2021. As we begin today, I just want to note a couple of different things um, from our bulletin in those regards. Um, the February calendar is coming out and so many of you will be getting it uh, via email and the newsletter in that way, but also if you want to come by and pick one up at church, you can certainly do that. The prayer list that's in the bulletin this week, a um, couple of updates, um, be in prayer for Marge Olson with her um, broken tibia and uh, that you'd be praying for her. Um, a cancer update, a couple of those. Uh, Mary Smith, who is Mary Anderson's second mom, um, they've stopped treatments now and she's been placed on hospice. So be in prayer for Mary in that way and also a, a prayer praise kathy aronson had surgery it was successful and uh, they believe they've removed all the cancer and they'll be working on what to do there um, next in that way uh, as we look at the calendar ahead just want to remind you to uh, continue on with things uh, there's youth group going on um, we just found out here uh, on friday that there will not be a fly convention this year, uh, the Free Lutheran Youth Convention at Estes Park. They'll be postponing it for a couple years. And so you can be in prayer as we think of things and uh, work on different things that way for the youth in the upcoming months, upcoming years. Uh, also, just a reminder that uh, quilting starts up again this week um, here at Rose at 9.30 on Tuesday mornings. And there's that opportunity also, uh, the first Wednesday of each month, uh, First United Lutheran is going to start up their men's breakfast again. And so at 7 a.m. in the morning, that is an opportunity um, for men to gather over there. And they have a, a speaker of some kind or somebody who does devotions each Wednesday, uh, first Wednesday of each month. I do want to remind you again that the Midwinter Bible Conference is this coming Friday and Saturday, February 5th and 6th at United Free Lutheran in Greenbush. One thing to add to that, they will on Saturday be having a potluck, not a potluck meal, but a meal will be served on Saturday afternoon after the uh, Bible, con or the Bible conference is done. And so if you want to stick around, they'll be plating, plating things and all the uh, rules will be followed that way, but it's an opportunity for you in that way. A week from this Sunday, sledding is supposed to happen at Malung in the afternoon. So that's an opportunity as well from 1 to 3 o'clock in that way. I mentioned last week that every, the last few years that we've scheduled this, they've had to reschedule it because of a snowstorm. So be ready for a snowstorm this coming weekend, um, next weekend uh, in that way. No, hopefully they'll be able to hit it right on time this year at Malung and that opportunity will be there. Let's start with a word of prayer and then let's go right on into what God has in store for us today. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift again of another day, another chance to worship you. And as this goes out over um, the, the media ways that we can do this through YouTube and such, um, Lord, use it in, as only you can in the hearts uh, of people that are hearing it, but in our hearts as well as we worship you today. Um, we do thank you, Lord, for how you're working in lives. We pray for the many who are struggling in different ways. Uh, we think of, of Marge Olson. We ask for healing for her. We uh, pray for Mary Anderson's second mom, Mary Smith, and we just lift her before you. We uh, pray for Kathy Aronson. We praise you for the work of the doctors here, and we pray that they've gotten everything with regards to her cancer. We pray for the families who have lost loved ones, and we just ask for your hand upon them especially. We think of uh, Wayne and Rhonda Rothenberger and uh, in the loss of their son Cody we just lift them before you pray for Connor especially too in the loss of his dad we uh, pray for the Huglins we think of uh, Kay Brazier as well in the loss of her son Edward we uh, lift all these things before you and ask for your hand upon this service as we as we worship together may you accept our praise may you accept our confessions and uh, may you once again reach down and touch each of our hearts. I pray in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. 
Our opening song today is a, a hymn that just simply calls on God um, to be nearer to us. But it's a prayer, but also more than that, it's just reminding ourselves that God is involved. He's uh, with us each step of the way. So let's sing together. You'll see the words on the screen there. Nearer my God to thee. notice with our songs today, <coughs> excuse me, um, the eternity aspect will be a theme because our text for the sermon today involves talking about specifically what will happen at the end of time. Um, as we begin today, uh, let's start with a confession of sin and we'll use the confession that we very often use. You'll see it up on the screen and I ask that you'd simply bow your hearts with me as we Turn to the only one who can truly forgive. So join me if you would, please. 
Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For scripture readings today, the first scripture reading is the text for our message. And uh, we are finally finishing off the book of Zechariah. So if you'd turn in Zechariah to chapter 14, I'd like to read those last verses beginning at verse 12 and down through verse 21. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. On that day men will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. Each man will seize the hand of another and they will attack each other. Judah too will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected. Great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. A similar plague will strike the horses and mules, the camels and the donkeys and all the animals in those camps. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague he inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. On that day... Holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots and the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. Also, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And these are Jesus' own words as he talks about the judgment at the end of time. Beginning there at verse 31 of chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in the heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance and the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, 
you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Here ends our scripture readings today. We're going to confess our faith by using a song. Um, this song was written by Fanny Crosby, and she was blind from a very young age um, as a baby and things that way, and she wrote many songs. She was asked one time what her favorite song was, and she really didn't have a favorite, but she said, you need to hear the words to this new song that I have. And the words were this song, Saved by Grace. As we proclaim our faith, one of the things I want you to consider is when we stand before our Lord, the only thing we're going to be able to say is that we've been saved by your grace, O oh God. So let's sing it together, this wonderful, wonderful old song, this gospel song, Saved by Grace. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing But oh the joy when I shall wake Within the palace of the King And I shall see him face to face And tell the story saved by grace And I shall see him face to face And tell the story saved by grace Someday my earthly house will fall I cannot tell how soon twill be but this I know, my all in all, has now a place in heaven for me. And I shall see him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face, and tell the story saved. By grace. Someday when fades the golden sun beneath the rosy tinted west, my blessed Lord will say well done, and I shall enter in to rest, and I shall see him face to face. And tell the story saved by grace And I shall see him face to face And tell the story saved by grace Someday till then I'll watch and wait My lamp all trimmed and burning bright that when my Savior opes the gate, my soul to him may take its flight. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved. I hope that that's your confession when that day comes for you. For our children's message today, you'll know it's got a, notice it's got an interesting title, uh, Disability Dishwashing. And uh, the two scripture references, kids, that I want you to consider with this one are from, first of all, Leviticus 19, verse 14. We don't go to Leviticus very often, but I want you to notice that in this passage, God gives specific instructions regarding the treatment of people who are disabled. Now, do you know what it means for someone to be disabled? 
It means that they aren't able to do something that a lot of people are able to do. For some people, they might be blind. And so they're disabled in that way. And of course, there are ways to, to get around those things these days, to learn how to deal with. Or somebody is deaf, or somebody has a leg that doesn't work right, or a learning disability, or something along those lines. But listen to what God says in Leviticus 19.14. And try and remember that one because... It says there, don't curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. (laughs) But fear God. I am the Lord. (laughs) The way we need to treat people is with kindness, isn't it? And there's another verse that I want you to think about with this. Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We should treat people who are different than ourselves with kindness. We should treat people who are the same as us with kindness. Because every person is precious to God. So here's your challenge for this week within your family. (laughs) Um, Tell your family that uh, you're going to take a night and you're going to give the dishwasher in your house a break. Okay, I'm not talking about the person, but the actual, if you have a dishwasher there, to give it a break. Or if you have somebody who does the dishes all the time, if your mom or your dad does the dishes all the time or one of you does the dishes all the time, it's time to take a break and to do it all as a family. And so you clear the table all together And you get ready to wash, rinse, and dry and put away all the dishes. You're going to do them the old-fashioned way. You're going to dry them all and do things that way. And you give everybody a job. But before you all get started, you announce that each person has to work with a disability during the dishwashing. So assign each family member some kind of disability. For example, maybe one person has to work without speaking. I know that's hard for some. And another will have to have their eyes closed or you'll wrap a bandana around and so they're like they're blind for the whole thing. And the third one can only use their left hand or something like that. So make sure everybody has a disability and you work together to get the dishes all clean, all dried, and all put away. And let everyone resume the normal use of their bodies afterwards And read those verses again, Leviticus 19, 14, and then Ephesians 4, 32, do, do, doodly, do, okay? And so you can do that, but try that out this week and be reminded of how precious people are. Before we go to the message today and we we hit the ending there of Zechariah and we'll look at what the Lord has as he talks about the end of time and uh, eternity as we look at things that way. Let's sing one more song that talks about facing eternity, that day when we get to be face to face with Christ our Savior. So let's sing together that wonderful song, and you'll have the words there up on the screen.
Well, we've had a few songs about eternity and about heaven specifically and meeting our Savior. But as God has Zechariah here at the end of this book, this end of, end of this minor prophet, and again, the minor prophets are only minor because of their length. But the message here is an amazing message as Zechariah talks about the end of time. You may remember a couple of weeks ago we covered the first half of this chapter and we looked at that new Jerusalem that would come. And we hit some of that very same idea today. It's almost like he repeats things in one sense to bring home the message. I've entitled it Holy to the Lord because we will see it the last verses there of Zechariah 14, we will see it talk about holy to the Lord. And we'll catch some of that idea. But I want to start out with the introduction here, just this thought for you. That the world that we live in today is a temporary place. <laughs> but I want to remind you, it is life. And it's life that is to be lived. There are some religions that would say that this life is just a diversion. It's just something that we kind of go through. It's just a game. It's some religious game that we play. But it isn't. Life is a gift from God. Life here on this earth, even though it's tainted by sin, it's still one that we want to live. We are to live, and as we talked about a couple weeks ago, to live with eternity in view, but to live today and we want to live and trust in our lord and savior because then we have a new creation that the one true god can bring into our lives right now and then for eternity the world is a temporary place let me give you a few scriptures just really quick just so you know that truth and be reminded second corinthians 4 18 so we fix our eyes not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. <laughs> They're temporary, in other words. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Isaiah 40, 6 and 7, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. Their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall. The breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely we as people are grass. <laughs> now there's a better part to that verse. The word of the Lord stands forever. But the things of this earth are temporary. <laughs> In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, 31, those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. <laughs> For this world as we know it will soon pass away. Now it's never saying that we should not take care of the things that we have in this world. But the reminder is, is that we're just stewards of these things. Because all these things will pass away. And finally, Hebrews 1 verses 10 through 12. You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They'll perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. <laughs> and like a garment, they will be changed. Or sorry, like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, O Lord, and your years will have no end. In the verses that we're going to look at today, in verses 12 through 21, we see the prophet bring it all before us again as we consider the coming of the king, Jesus' second coming, a picture of the world that lies ahead of everybody who's ever lived. And in verses 12 through 15 of this text, I want to just give you a brief little outline here. We're going to have a very chilling picture of the wrath of God upon the wicked. To put it more simply, we're going to have a picture of what hell will be like. 
And then at the very last verses, verses 20 and 21, if we take the bookends of this scripture, we have a picture of the blessedness and the holiness of heaven. And then in between, in verses 16 through 19, we have a portion that talks about what distinguishes where we go. The difference between people in the end of time. So let's jump right in and we need to take a look here and we start with that chilling picture of hell. God's wrath upon wickedness. And you'll see two things here that that stick out. It's the wrath of God. (laughs) We will see God's judgment. You may remember back in verses 1 and 2 of this very chapter, Zechariah 14, We saw Jerusalem and God's people were plundered. But in verse 3, God intervened in things. And he executes judgment. We see that judgment here. We see the wrath of God. Now, when we do the Apostles' Creed, we say that we believe. I believe as we talk about Jesus Christ in the center of God. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father after he's gone up into heaven And from there, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. There will be that judgment. And there's a picture here of that judgment. We notice it here first. The first part of this picture of judgment is a picture of personal disintegration. I've used the word disintegration Not because everything goes away, but it breaks down. And the first part is a very, it's one of the most chilling statements in all of Scripture. The enemies of God are overtaken with a plague that leaves them utterly powerless. They've been fighting against God's people. They've been fighting against God, but they can no longer resist His wrath and his judgment. (laughs) This will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. As I read through scripture, I find that there's one unforgivable sin. We worry about an unforgivable sin, but there's one unforgivable sin, and the unforgivable sin is to die in unbelief or to face eternity in unbelief because that's the time of judgment. This gruesome description with the flesh dissolving and the bodies disintegrating and the eyes and tongues rotting is indeed terrible, but it's consistent with the New Testament scriptures regarding the realities that await the unbeliever, the unrepentant. The simple truth of scripture is right before us. If we're not a true believer in the one true God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that one true God, um, this is the destiny that awaits us. I've used these verses many times and it's the simplicity of Scripture as it lays it out in 1 John 5, 11 and 12. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and that life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. And there's that assurance to those who truly believe. But it also simply says, He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The truth is is that Jesus spoke more of the awful reality of hell than he did of the beauty and the wonder of heaven. In Matthew 8, verse 12, Jesus talked about the kingdom that was to come. And he said that there would be those that would be thrown into the outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Dennis Swamberg, the minister of encouragement, once told a story. He said, 
He remembers the story of an old country preacher who was preaching his heart out one evening. He was preaching the last sermon on a series about hell. And the people had heard messages on hell for at least a month. And at the peak of his sermon, he yelled out to the congregation, and in hell there will be weeping and gnashing and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And you could have heard a pin drop in the, in the church. He said, did you hear me? And he yelled all the louder. <laughs> there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the folks were doing some heavy breathing at this point. And then he said it a third time for emphasis there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And there was a country farmer in the, near the front row. He didn't attend church very often, but out of respect for his wife, he had come that day. And even though he was an unbeliever and a skeptic, he would do that, but he, he decided to have a little fun with the pastor. And he said, what if, you ain't, what if you got false teeth? He got up and said to the pastor right in front of the whole congregation, everybody... <gasps> wondering how the pastor was going to respond. And he was a little discombobbled for a little bit, but then he said, and he yelled at him, he said, teeth will be provided, he said. <laughs> and we laugh and we joke about hell sometimes. But the truth is, is that it isn't a joke. <laughs> we joke about pastors liking to preach about it. And we should preach about it when it's there in the scriptures. It needs to be laid out in the reality of it's there. But the reality is we don't want people to go there. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus, we get a little picture of what hell could be like. It says there in verses 23 and 24 of Luke 16 that when the rich man lifted his eyes in Hades or in hell, he was in torment. And he was somehow able to see across to Abraham and Lazarus in the Lord's bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. I want to remind you that the descriptions that are in Scripture are descriptions they don't come close to what the reality will be like. Now it fits the same way when we talk about heaven too. There will be personal disintegration. <laughs> There's no repentance in hell because there's no more chances at that point. What you choose in this life will determine the disintegration or it will determine your complete healing and your glorification in eternity if you're trusting in Him. I just want to read these scriptures to you because it does the best job of just laying it out for you. In Revelation 22, 11 through 17, this is what John writes. He says, let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. And then Jesus talks to John. He says, behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I'll give to everyone according to what he's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. <laughs> we had a per picture of personal disintegration, but there's also a picture of relational disintegration, how we deal with others. And we've seen it before in Scripture. You see it there in verses 13 and 14, verse 13 here, sorry, 
On that day, men will be stricken by the Lord with great panic, and each man will seize the hand of another, but what they will do is they will destroy each other. They'll attack each other. Now, we've seen this in Scripture before where God brings the judgment in that way. (laughs) We see it back in the book of Judges, in Judges 7, when Gideon narrows it down to 300 men and they're to fight all the Midianites. (laughs) And we read there that when they blow the trumpets and when they break the jars and they yell, For the Lord and for Gideon, it says there, verse 22 and 23 of that chapter, When those 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shittah and and beyond, and the Israelites went after them, and they pursued the Midianites. God's judgment and the way that he worked there is that they begin to go at each other. (laughs) But in reality, doesn't that fit the way that sin works in the hearts and lives of people today? We take advantage of each other and we go at each other. In 2 Chronicles 20, we have the the story of Hezekiah as they are to fight the Ammonites and the Moabites. And there's so many of them that they can't hardly see them. And they don't know what to do, so they ask God how to go into battle. And God says to King Jehoshaphat, He says to King Jehoshaphat, Send out the choir. And so that's what they do. They send out the choir singing praise to God. (laughs) And when they send out the choir, it says there in verses 22 and 23 that the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. When they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. (laughs) It's a picture. One of the marks of judgment of God is the tearing apart, the disintegration of human relationships, of fellowship, of closeness, of connection. And hell itself is an alienation from God, but also from human and personal contact. We forget that sometimes. The picture that so many people have of hell today is this place where everybody's partying and Satan is there with his horns and his tail. (laughs) That's not the case. Hell is hostility toward each other and the antipathy and the antagonism and the enmity and the dislike and the distaste and the hatred that's been here on earth will be multiplied. That's part of the point of the imagery of the outer darkness. C.S. Lewis wrote a book years ago called The Great Divorce. It's not about divorce. It's about a busload of people as they're taken into eternity. And we see how people respond. And those that have responded in this life in disbelief will not even be able to enjoy heaven if they could go there. And that's the point he's making is what sin does, and in hell, there's that disintegration of relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with everybody else. Hell may be fully populated, but it's not a party. Every one of hell's residents will be very much alone. Quarantine is nothing. But to be alone, to be in darkness. Thirdly, in verses 14 and 15, we see a material disintegration. It says there in those verses, this plague will come to the horses and the mules and the camels and the donkeys and the other animals there in verse 15. But in verse 14, It also says there that the wealth of the surrounding nations will be collected, the great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. Will all our gold and silver or precious things do us any good in eternity? Our car, our house, our retirement funds, our toys, our Xboxes, our coin collections, our antiques and our paintings. Materialism 
having and wanting more will quickly be of no use. All the trinkets for which we live, that our hearts crave, to which we run, that we substitute for Christ as the objects of our satisfaction and delight, in which we've invested all our self-worth and our personal value, if we're found outside of Christ when he comes on that day, they'll all be stripped away. (laughs) And we'll be left bereft, bankrupt, and barren. It's a chilling picture indeed, is it not? As I thought about that, I couldn't help but think about how the pharaohs of old in Egypt, in many cultures, when they would die, what would they do? They would put everybody in the grave with them, sometimes even people and servants and food and all these things for the afterlife. But it would do no good. They'd only be found years later. I think about the old saying, you never see a hearse with a U-Haul. I think about the young man, the old story goes that he somehow got a couple of gold nuggets or gold bars with him into heaven. And the old joke goes that when he was there and somebody saw him with the gold bars, they said, good, you brought street material. (laughs) And again, we don't joke about those things, but it says right in Scripture in Revelation 21, 21, the streets of the city we made of pure gold. We can't take it with us when we go. The old song is, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue and the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. It's just stuff. Don't get me wrong again. We're to take care of what we have. The Bible notes that. But again, we live with the eternity aspect in view. We enjoy what God gives. It brought me to those verses again. I I love these verses in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. We know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things, with perishable things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from our forefathers. But we were saved, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That leads us, as we've talked about eternity apart from God, so we've talked about the chilling picture of hell and the reality of it. That leads us to look at the last couple of verses, to jump to the end and look at the glorious picture of heaven that God has, God's blessings and God's holiness. And the main point in all of this of what he writes there, and you look at these verses, it says, in that day holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls of the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holiness to the Lord of hosts. It's this idea and the picture of the universal holiness of God. And to, to try and describe to you this holiness, we fall so short. <laughs> It's hard for people to understand, why would I want to be in the presence of a holy God? Isn't he just a boring God who wants me to do everything right? And Think about what you're saying when you say that. When you, become, when you come to know him, you may remember back in Zechariah 3, the picture of Joshua, or sorry, yeah, Joshua, the high priest, he was had that... That vision, he was robed in all those filthy garments. And Satan is there accusing him. And the Lord intervenes in his justifying mercy. And he takes away those garments and clothes. And he puts on him those white linen garments, pure and radiant. In Zechariah 3, 5, it says, Then, then I said, Zechariah jumps in, he says, put a clean turban on his head. (laughs) 
Jesus has put on this beautiful and, and washed him white as snow, so to speak. But why did, why did he jump in and say, put a clean turban on his head? If you go back into the book of Exodus 39, verses 30 and 31, it's interesting you read about this in, in the, the picture of the, the, the priests and what they had to wear. And one of the things they would wear is this turban that would have a placard that would be put on there that, that said, holiness to the Lord. to be reminded and be declared as white as snow, to be declared clean, to be declared forgiven, all the filthiness gone, and to stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone, holy to the Lord. And did you catch it here Is he, in those verses? Everything, holy to the Lord, is going to be inscribed on everything, even the plain pots and pans. Not just the pots that were in the temple, but the pots. That's a small picture of heaven. The purity and the radiance of the Lord Jesus Christ will shine in every home, in every heart. It will be reflected in every product of activity. It will be seen in every instrument of nature. Sin will be utterly, irrevocably, universally eradicated. It'll be gone. All will be holy to the Lord. <laughs> I love the words of Romans 14, verses 7 and 8. In verse 8 it says, If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So when we live or die... We belong to the Lord. Do you belong to Him? There's one other phrase in this little portion that's kind of interesting because it says, no more Canaanite. No longer there will be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord. It's, it's a word, sometimes it could be, no, there will no longer be any merchant. Let me give you the kind of idea. There's no more need for supplies in that sense, but there's also a picture here, there's no more unrighteousness, no more wickedness. The Canaanites were considered that way. It doesn't mean that a Canaanite cannot get to heaven. But that idea of, of a foreigner sneaking in, someone who's not supposed to be there. In Ezekiel 44.9, the picture is there. The Lord says no foreigner should enter the temple. But do you notice what it says? It says no foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh is to enter the sanctuary. To have, an uncir to have a circumcised heart or to have a heart that believes. We know that all of Scripture says that our nationality isn't going to matter. <laughs> the Israelites were where Jesus was to come from and they hold that special part of the chosen people. But if we trust in the Lord, whether we're Norwegian or whether we're um, from South Malaysia, no matter where we're from, we become his child. In Joel chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. Never again will those that are outside of trusting in the Lord. Never again will they be able to invade. To be in the, holy, in the presence of God in His holiness, that's the place to be. When we know Him and what He's done, it becomes the true desire of our heart. It, it's hard to explain to an unbeliever pure holiness and the glory of God. It's hard for a believer to grasp it. To dwell in full fellowship and communion with your Savior, the Creator God. The reality of hell and the reality of heaven is quite a contrast, isn't it? 
In Revelation chapter 21, verses 26 and 27, it says, The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought in to heaven. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. How can our name be written there? <laughs> when we trust in what Jesus Christ has done, when we rely on His righteousness, when we confess, saved by grace. By the way, when um, Fanny Crosby wrote that song, remember she had been blind since she was a baby, and I shall see Him face to face. <laughs> to have that first sight and say, I'm saved by grace. There's an old song that goes, Is my name written there on the page white and fair? In the book of thy kingdom is my name written there. The second verse of that song says, Lord, my sins, they are many, like the sands of the sea, but thy blood, O my Savior, is sufficient for me. <laughs> For thy promise is written in bright letters that glow. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. In Revelation 22, 3, sorry, in Isaiah 35, 8 through 10, I jumped ahead of myself. It says, a highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall be not, not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return, and they'll come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall free, flee away. <laughs> Do you want a place of no more sorrow? <laughs> Trust in the Lord. Oh, on this wor in this life we will still have sorrow. But take heart, he's overcome those things. In Revelation 22, 3 says there will be no more curse. No more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and the servant shall serve him. Now you might be saying, Pastor Todd, what about those verses in the middle? <laughs> I've only got another two hours to go. So no, just quickly here. But the verses in the middle really are a picture then of the great difference between the two peoples. You're going, what? How do you see that? Well, look at those middle verses. It fits perfectly in between here. As it says there, then everyone who survives all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, the Lord God Almighty. And it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Harvest, the Feast of Booths, to go up and to worship. And the picture there is of the final harvest. Will we worship the Lord Almighty or will you not go up and worship Him? Will you? Let me put it another way. Will you trust in Him or will you choose not to? The difference is eternal punishment eternal separation or eternal blessing or eternal presence of God. The difference is hell or heaven. There have been two groups of people throughout history as we face eternity. Two groups that will be there again when Jesus comes. <laughs> Those who have come to worship, to praise the Lord, to trust Him, and they know the harvest and they are thankful for when that harvest comes, when Christ comes to get them. And those who have never bowed their knee or they've pretended or they said, I can wait.
those who celebrate the feast of tabernacles, the harvest, and those who are not ready for that day when it comes. What about you? In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What about you? Will you trust in the Lord? Trust in what Jesus has done? Or will you try to do it on your own or try? It's an eternal difference. It's not my job to make you jump in one way or the other. But I will beg you. I will beg you to be reconciled to God. He has paid the price. And he loved you so much that he would die. <laughs> and not only that, he rose again to give us life. Oh, I could preach hellfire and brimstone and I perhaps should more often. But the truth in preaching it is that knowing that he desires to know you. <laughs> Trust him so that you can sing with your whole heart what we're going to sing here at the end of this. <laughs> that you can sing the truth that he, the pearly gates, will open so that we can enter in. It's not us. <laughs> it's that wonderful truth of what he's done. As Zechariah finished this, <laughs> As the Lord had him finished, he pushed and told the people about eternity. Let me just say it again. Trust. Repent and turn. And trust and go that narrow road. The way that Jesus has put before us. The way to the cross. Let's sing together this, this song in closing. And I hope you can sing it knowing that he has opened that way. <laughs> Trust in him.
Let's pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction, and it's kind of a doxology at the same time here from Jude chapter 20, Jude verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Trust in him. In closing today for a threefold amen, so to speak, we're going to just sing that first verse of when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. And the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there.